Hello, everyone, and welcome to season three, episode four of Talent Talks. Um, this episode, we are going to be talking about some topics uh, around Black History Month, and as it is the month of February. Um, and to, with us today, we have a special guest, Ms. Brandy Kikoa of BKKOA Salon. Um, in Old Town Temecula. Uh, Brandy, would you mind introducing yourself? Sure. Um, my name is Brandy Kekoa, and I own uh, BKKOA Incorporated, which is a curly hair safe haven for my curlies. It's a salon, um, and I also have an international product line, but I am based out of Temecula, California, and I currently have 32 um, locations that are um, BK Cola certified salons. That is absolutely phenomenal. I uh, I was actually one of the things I was going to ask you about was the uh, BK Cola Pro, um, where you certify stylists on how to use your product line. Um, if you wanted to tell us a little bit more about how that came to be. Um, yeah, I just, I wanted to create something that was designed for the stylist to use. Um, there's a lot of like big companies out there that have been monopolizing on uh, textured hair where they never cared about textured hair before. Um, now it's like the thing and it's popular. And um, when they were, these bigger brands were coming out with, um, products they were putting um you know just bad stuff in it you know like parabens and like heavy emollients that weren't good for the hair right so, <clears throat> so it's going to damage it rather than help keep it healthy right right so I was like forget this you know I'm going to come out with something so I teamed up with a cosmetic chemist um this was in 2007 and I decided to launch my first leave-in conditioner. And then after that, you know, I launched the shampoo and I launched, you know, some more styling agents. Mm -hmm. And, you know, after that, I was encouraging other, you know, stylists to work on curly hair, be comfortable with curly hair. And with that came with the products. Um, and yeah, I certified my first salon in, gosh, it was 2010 in Mississippi, Hattiesburg, Mississippi was the very first salon. And from there, it's just kind of snowballed out of control. You know, I talked to my stylist about the importance of, you know, working on someone's crown, you know, mm, curly hair. I love hair that. Is, yeah, curly hair is one of those things where you just, you you have to be very gentle with it. You have to know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And it's it's also something, you know, believe it or not, for a woman to embrace their curls, it's like kind of a big deal now for yeah. if, you, if you're used to straightening it. So really like the consultation process is the process. It's like, dang, you know, you have to really sit down and talk to the client to see if they're ready to wear their curls. You know, there's been times where I tell I've told the client, like, I don't think you're ready. Yeah, it's a and, well, because it's a big undertaking. It's a it's a, a time commitment and a, a financial commitment as well. So yeah. Yeah, can... it's a it's a total thing because like a lot of women that are like in the professional field, you know, attorneys and doctors, and you know, I ha even have some real estate agents that are having a hard time because you know, they, they don't feel that other people will accept their crown the way that it is, their curls. And it's, it's, we actually, there's a law in place now, the Crown Act, if you guys have ever heard of that. Um, it's a law that they've had to create to where you cannot discriminate against anyone that wears their natural texture hair. Right, because they were treating people like it was unprofessional to wear their natural hair, right? Yes. Yes, or not hiring them or saying you need to change your hair because it's not within our protocol. I mean, it's been a and I'm like, what the heck? We're yeah, in that's ridiculous. Yeah. So it's like curly hair, it's like a thing, y'all. Like if you come to the salon, you'll see like people's tears of joy or people cry. I mean, it's just like 
it's a thing. And that's why I call it a safe haven because when you do come in, it's no judgment whether you want to wear your hair curly or if you're not ready to wear it curly. It's just a space that I've created in Temecula. <laughs> right. Well, I would. that's another thing I was going to ask you is what made you decide to start here as opposed to any other place? That's a great question. I ask myself that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, I, I, I gotta say it's probably because first of all, I went to high school here. Um, I graduated okay. in the year 99 uh, at TV, Temecula Valley High. My so alma mater. I'm, I'm telling my age, <laughs> it's all good. Um, and I just, I, I've always loved Temecula, right? But there, there are some things here that you know, that need changing, you know, it's, Absolutely. They, it needs a lot more, they need to be more inclusive here. Mm -hmm. So I, when I moved, well, we moved, I moved away um, after high school and then I came back. And when I got into hair, I said, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to put my footprint here because we deserve it. Yes. You know, they don't have, there's nothing else out here like this. And there needs to be, there, there needs to be. And I'm like, I'll, I'll do it. You know, I'll, I'll be the trailblazer. I'll, I'll be the first one to do it because it just needs to be, you know, it needs to be more mm -hmm. inclusive here. And yeah, I could have easily opened a salon in Long Beach or in LA where I trained, but I just thought there's such a need here. Why should people have to drive two or three hours to get their curls done when I'm mm -hmm. here? So I just, I did it. And I'm, you know, it's, and I'm in old town, <laughs> old town Temecula of all places. But mm -hmm. you know what? Hey, we're here and we're not going anywhere. And oh, I'm and bringing that's in my favorite part. It, like the, be, how you ended up in old town, you know, which is like kind of the, the core of where all of that lack of inclusivity started. Oh, yes. You know, and you you came in and said, I'm going to do this and I'm not going anywhere and I'm going to build a community around this. And I mean, it's, it's incredible how many, I mean, so many people that I know around town, like everybody knows Brandy to go get, you know, like to go get their curly cut or to get their products. And I mean, like even um, like at my house, you know, you have my sister come in um, and my mom is allergic to some of the st uh, stuff that's in yeah. the hair, in the products, and you all have the in-house apothecary, and you can custom make a product so that she still gets the benefits for my sister's hair, but right. doesn't have an allergic reaction. And, you know, there's just so many, there's so much care and attention to detail that you put into the whole brand and experience and it's it's really beautiful thank you I appreciate that uh so you said that um you when you learned like you trained in LA but you learned before that was that that was from your family your grandma and your aunt Am I yeah wondering? yeah I'm actually third generation so <clears throat> my grandmother um did hair my aunt did hair. My actually, my great grandmother did hair as well. I still have her pressing combs. Oh, so wow. it's really, I I learned a lot in Los Angeles. But I can honestly say that this is in my blood. Um, I'm I'm currently training my niece, and she just has it. Oh, you know, she that. just she mm -hmm. just has it, and and it's just I just love making people feel good when they leave my chair. And it's not, I tell people all the time, it's not just, it's not about the hair. You know, it's so much more than that. It's like a feeling that, mm -hmm. that I like to give people when they leave, you know, it's a feeling of confidence. Yeah. Well, and I think in a lot of ways, you're, you're giving people permission to be their authentic selves and to embrace it and love it and see themselves as beautiful and worthy of love and respect yeah yeah and it feels good <laughs> yeah it does <laughs> it, it feels really good I have a very rewarding career and I feel I feel very blessed to have it I, I love your story um, thank 
Yeah. <laughs> and thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, being willing to join us today and talk about that. Um, I did want to um, shift gears just a little bit um, now that we kind of know uh, where you're at now. And uh, I wanted to talk about um, in the spirit of Black History Month, you know, the people will bring up um, historical figures, um, you know, major members of the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, uh, Rosa Parks, and the list goes on. Um, and, you know, even further back than that. But also there's this um, kind of a newer term that I've noticed popping up saying that Black history is now. And, you know, I think of people like you, you know, coming in and, and blazing this trail in Temecula in a place where, you know, there wasn't proper representation and there wasn't, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, it wasn't inclusive. Um, and like, you're making your mark on history. And I was wondering, um, first of all, how you feel about you're like putting yourself in that for it with from that lens, you know, like that you are going to be somebody that is in the history books. I mean, I don't know. That's when you say it that way, like, wow. <laughs> I, I just, gosh, when you say it that way, it is like, wow, because I am a rarity where we're at. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I, I plan to continue to make my mark and speak out about certain injustices because recently I, I had one that was huge, kind of went viral um, mm -hmm. because I just, all I want is to be treated like everybody else, right? I mm -hmm. don't want special treatment. I'm not asking for special treatment, but I won't allow anyone to um, step all over me, disrespect me and not acknowledge what I've done in this town. Right. And um, I've recently come across something that I'm, I'm being very vocal about because the town is very cliquish. Mm -hmm. And um, with me leaving my mark, I think I've already kind of left it and, and people are, you know, reaching out to me now because I've been very vocal about the cliques here. And there, there is racism here, mm -hmm. you know, people don't want to admit it. They don't want to talk about it, but I went to high school here and there was skinheads at the school and they did nothing to protect us. Mm. And, um, I'm going to continue to be vocal. I'm going to continue to try, try and be a trailblazer here. Um, I'm not, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> I'm not going and you anywhere. shouldn't be this you are right where you need to be you are changing people's lives on the daily and in the long term I think having a really positive impact on the community and you're changing people's minds yeah that's that's what I'm I'm trying to do um I'm just trying to I'm I'm trying to <laughs> force things to be more inclusive, I suppose, you know, mm -hmm. um, I, I'm going to make people feel uncomfortable if they're not inclusive. Um, if they're not, you know, showing faces that, that I think we should be, that should be seen, mm -hmm. you know, um, within marketing here in Temecula with everything, they, they, there's, there's work that needs to be done. And yes, I'm speaking out in, <laughs> You know, I started my own, my, my, my saying is I'm going to build my own table. You know, I'm not going to beg for a seat. I refuse to beg for a seat at anybody else's table. I'm going to build my own. I love that. And that's what I'm doing. I started a whole talk show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's called Small Biz Talk. Businesses on in Temecula because they're not inclusive here. They're very cliquish and they only like will showcase or spotlight their friends and people that they only know and um you know I'm 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 disrupting things a bit no and I love that like yeah it, keep it up it, it, I'm going to <laughs> see we we're talking about hair and now we're going off on something else that I'm doing because I'm 
I'm trying to make change here in this town because I love Temecula and I know that we can all do it. But, Mm -hmm. you know, there has to be those uncomfortable discussions and those uncomfortable feelings people may have in order for Mm -hmm. us to heal, move on and grow. Absolutely. Well, and I think, you know, for a lot of people, it ends up being due to a lack of education you know, like they just, they didn't grow up talking about it. And so, you know, they kind of grew up in this like blissful, ignorant state. And, you know, and then of course there are people that very much know what they're doing and what they're saying. And then, you know, but I, I love that you are all about talking about it and yeah, we have like, like opening people's eyes, you know? Exactly. We have to. Temecula, there's a, they're just in this bubble here. Mm-hmm. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like the things that sometimes are said, you know, like, um, gosh, it was, who was it that said it? She was comparing herself to Rosa Parks. It oh, was, gosh. um, yes, uh, a council member on city mm-hmm. council. Her name's Jessica. Something. She was, she compared herself to Rosa Parks because she had to wear a mask and she said she felt like she's being pushed to the back of the bus oh no and this honey. woman was comfortable enough to compare herself to Rosa Parks because people live in a bubble here yeah <laughs> yeah wow so I'm just I'm just trying to break things up like what makes somebody that comfortable how do you get that comfortable to say something like that you know it just yeah. it's it needs there I things need to be disrupted you know mm-hmm. like the mayor has been known for saying things and getting removed and it's just it's crazy you know my daughter's going to high school out here and they still racist nothing mm-hmm. has changed I'm 40 years old. Why is she having problems with racism? Yeah, it, you, that made me think of their, um, like the official Temecula slogan or whatever is old traditions, new opportunities. Mm. Oh, mm. I never thought about like that. Oh, gosh. Mm-hmm. Wow. Ooh. it's literally That's- big bold oh. letters on the side of the highway when you drive up into Temecula it's and you know it's like you said mind. things haven't changed and that that particular bit like it makes me wonder sometimes how much of that is people being ignorant and mm-hmm. how much of that is people being intentional you know people don't want change some people just don't want change you know um I can give you an example of of something that just recently happened I had a barber that's in my shop my salon Mm -hmm. and she's she's lesbian right Mm -hmm. and she went downstairs she likes the smoke shop so she would go down there to the smoke shop right okay she goes down there she likes cigars and um there's these dudes sitting there, got Confederate flags on their hat and basically excused her from the space. Wow. And she came upstairs. She was like, B, I can't. Like, is this for real? <laughs> yeah. And this, this was within, this was like a year and a half, two years ago. This actually happened. Yeah. Well, and, there, and there's no excuse for that. Like <laughs> the Confederacy died. In, but the fact that they're comfortable decide, enough to do yeah. it in this town and people don't think that there is a problem with racism. That's the issue. That is, that's the total, that's the, that's the problem. So I don't know if it's ignorance. I don't know if it's just, they don't want change. Mm-hmm. They don't, they, or they don't want change. I don't, I don't yeah. know. But yeah, I mean, but they, they do have say to that uncomfortable. change is like right up there in the top of you know things that people are afraid of mm-hmm. but I mean you, you can't stay like this forever no. baby no it cannot <laughs> no okay and we're not gonna let it no absolutely. we're not gonna let it so Brandy thank you so much for um for sharing your story I'm just listening and um and uh 
I applaud you for your courage to be in a town that is predominantly one particular, um, I guess, of one particular ideology versus your, the, the you know, the background that you, grew, that, that you, you know, the world that you grew up in. Now, um, I guess my question to you is how do you feel like, because we're talking about change and we're talking about, you know, really wanting to move in a direction that's a little, you know, that's more inclusive, more positive and more accepting of the differences that people have to offer in society um, and celebrating that. And with that, it, you know, obviously, you know, black, you know, we're, we are now in, in, in celebration of black history and celebration of every, of things that you have done of being, uh, of being a trailblazer. Um, I guess my um, branching off of what you and Kayla have been discussing regarding change and just, you know, trying to understand where people are, you know, why people are <laughs> in the mindset of ignorance. What do you mm -hmm. say, what would you say to somebody that just says, well, that's what, that's just what I grew up with. That's all I know. So this is why I think it's correct. Whereas someone like, you know, like us, we are, we are in the mindset of, well, I've gone out there and I've learned, even you have experienced, um, I've experienced, um, you know, racism, you know, and we've experienced things a certain way. You know, what would you say to people like that? They're just like, well, I grew up in this, my, my family line has said that this is correct and this is the world that I grew up in. So I don't experience racism. I don't experience somebody, you know, you know, sitting down and, and, and calling me names or calling me whatever they might, you know, they might be calling me. Um, so I guess, what would you say to somebody like that? That's a good question because whenever people say or have told me, then they're typically people you know, that are not of color, like, I don't experience that. And I tell you, tell them, that's what your privilege is. That's privilege. Because my son will experience it, my daughter will experience it, but your kids will not. So that's what the privilege is. And if they ask me, like, oh, well, this is how I grew up. And this is how things were, I would say, you know what, I challenge you to go somewhere else. I challenge you to leave the city. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I challenge you get to, out of the bubble. Yeah, I challenge <laughs> you to go. I challenge you to go in into a different circle of friends or, or a different circle of people. Step outside that circle. Talk to people that don't look like you for a, a month, you know, and hang out with us and see, just see how things are. And then I, I guarantee that they'll raise their eyebrow a smidgen and be like, hmm, she kind of got treated a little differently by that waitress. But if you're around people that look like you and they're, that think like you, how are you going to think anything different? Mm -hmm. You can't. And that means that they don't want to grow and they don't want to see. They want to keep the blinders over their eyes. So I would say, get out of the city. Go hey, go talk to somebody that you would normally wouldn't talk to, you know, and, and then and go from there. And then, then come back and tell me, you think, you don't think that there's a problem or you think everything is the same or everything is cool. But do those things first. Go out and explore and see that there is difference there there are differences and that there is something outside of the bubble thank you so much for um for that explanation and your in your and your uh, the way that you see it oh of course of course and you know we've i've i just recently bought uh five acres in wine country i have to give you guys this little this, tell you guys what just happened yes, to us i was gonna ask you about this i'm excited yeah so i bought me and my husband bought five acres in wine country, Temecula, across the street from my mom's favorite winery. My mom passed away a couple years ago and she wanted land and it just, it just happened. That's a whole nother story in itself. Anyways, me and my husband were standing on the land, you know, just looking at what we purchased. And this woman comes in a tr with a truck, what big white truck. And she says, can I help you guys? Oh, no. And we were like, oh, we're just, we're, we're standing, you know, we're like, what? You're yeah. standing here. She says, who owns this? Who lives here? 
questioning as, as if we had no right. And my husband's boss, who's a white man, was there and witnessed it and saw. And this is one of this is one that's typically like, oh, I love everybody, everybody, you know, like blinders. Mm -hmm. He saw. And after that, he started asking questions. You know, and I thought it was really interesting because when somebody sees it actually happening is when I think that it, something clicks. Mm -hmm. The light bulb turns on. And this wasn't the first time that this has happened to us, you know, and I, I don't like to have these experiences, but I almost want them to happen in front of people that are ignorant, you know? So, yeah. What's, what's important, Brandy, I thank you so much for, for being, uh, for coming, you know, for, I guess, for bringing that story out. Because some people I think are, some, I, I almost want to say that sometimes people are afraid to uh, tell their stories um, because they're maybe the wrong person will hear and they, and maybe harm will, 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 will come to them. Um, so I, uh, so thank you so much for sharing that story. Of course. Of course. Uh, you know, and I, and I have to agree with you and say, and when you say that sometimes you have to allow people to see it in, even though, cause I know that for, I can only speak for me when I say this is that sometimes when, when something like that is told to me, like, oh, well, you have to allow people to see it and experience it so that they could be able to, you know, I guess for lack of better words, believe you, <laughs> like mm -hmm. I'm crazy, this, I do experience these things. Um, it, it does upset me in a way because it's kind of like, okay, well, but I'm telling you is not what I'm telling you valid enough for you that you have to go out mm -hmm. and you have to actually physically see it. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, thank you so much for just sharing the story. I mean, guess cool. to that point, I had a conversation very months ago, uh, a few months ago with someone who, um, who had basically just said that they just want to stay in their lane. They don't want anybody to bother them. They're not, they're not racist in any way. Um, that's what they were telling me that they weren't racist. Um, but all they wanted to do was just to stay in their lane, they stay in their lane, not bother anybody kind of going back. What to does that, that mean? Kind what of does yeah. Kind of, it, 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 kind of like going back to that bubble that we were talking about. So I kept pushing because I'm like somebody. I'm just want to know. I mean, after all, I'm, I'm an aspiring journalist, so I'm gonna push. Um, so I was just asking, you know, yeah, exactly what you asked. You know, what does that mean? What do you mean by that? I said, well, what I mean by that is, is that I don't want to be told that I'm being racist because I don't agree with something or because I'm saying something to, to someone of a different race or a different color and be, and it being taken in a wrong way. So I guess I could kind of understand what they were coming, where they were in a sense coming from, because I kind of feel like sometimes, like I come from a Latin background. Um, mm -hmm. My background, I'm, I'm, I'm a Puerto Rican. So what that means is, is that I am, you know, I am uh, indigenous Indian, Spaniard, and I have, and, and black. So I have all those three mm -hmm. bloodlines kind of running within my blood. So um, what I, what I kind of gathered from that was, was that, okay, well, I guess I can kind of, again, I can kind of understand where you might be coming from because whenever we bring something up to somebody that may, may not necessarily, and I hate to, I, I kind of, it may not be as mindful, um, at, at two differences, um, might take it a certain way, might be offended by, by what somebody may, like, like somebody, um, but, that somebody of a lighter skin tone might say, like, for example, and I'm sorry, Kayla, I'm going to use you as an example. No, you're fine, hon, you're <laughs> uh, fine. Like, uh, Kayla, for example, has, uh, has a fairer skin than, than I do. So let's just say, for example, Kayla might say something to me that I might take complete, I might be completely offended by, even though she's not, she's not racist. So it's, well, that's where you have to have a conversation with somebody and you have to educate them on proper terminology and, you know, because that's, that's my biggest issue with all of it is whether you knew prior to saying something that it was racist or not to say it, if somebody tells you that 
you've offended them and that you've said something offensive and or inappropriate, then I think it's then on you to take that on board and do, you know, at least, you know, apologize, do some research, do some soul searching and mm -hmm. say, you know, okay, now, now I know better. Cause I'm not going to sit there and say that everybody should just know, like I'll, uh, that would be the ideal world. But the reality is that, you know, people grow up in different places, different backgrounds, and even people that grow up in the same place, you grow up with a different family who may or may not share the same belief system. You know, it's, it's very easy for there to be <clears throat> misunderstandings and like, but that doesn't give anybody the right to just act like it didn't happen when somebody else gets hurt by something that you say or do. Yeah, and, and I have to add one more thing too. It's like with how things are now, you know, it's it wasn't like this. I'm I'm older than y'all, I'm assuming, but it was you it, you really right now you really have to kind of watch what you say, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's another thing. Um in society now why people I don't know people may be afraid to have these conversations you know I have conversations or if someone says something offensive and the other person is like cuts them off and I just I'm okay with having conversations with people and saying no that's not right this 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 is right or this that and the mm -hmm. third. but one thing I'm not going to do is I'm not going to take my time out to teach you you know mm. what I'm saying? Like yeah. that's tiring. That's tiring for black uh, for uh, for black people. I'm not gonna speak for black people. For me, I'm tired of telling people, "Oh, no, no, you know that's wrong." No, it's like I can talk to you and say, "Girl, no, just look, read this book." Mm -hmm. That's just easier. That's just easier for me to do. Um, and if somebody isn't sure, if they're just just honestly ignorant then I, I'll do the same thing, just kind of read, read, read this book, you know, but at, at, right now, like, if people, I'm going on a tangent, but, but if, if people say something offensive, they, most of the time, they know what's wrong. Right, exactly. Oh. I like that you mentioned that, you know, just kind of refer somebody to a book, or, yeah. And again, is this just kind of going with what you had you've mentioned prior as well, and what Kayla had mentioned earlier as well? Um, get out of your bubble. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. I can. I Educate can. Educate yourself. You know, I can. I can understand where you know it, it is exhausting. Um, it is a lot of work. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it, work will continue to happen even after. You know, all of us are 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 no longer no longer <laughs> here. <laughs> I mean, it's been happening for well, you know, since the beginning of 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 um, I guess the America's birth. Um, oh, and well before that. You know, it. Oh yeah, you're y'all. You yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but you know, like I I do think that it's key that you mentioned. You know, again, just kind of pick something. Uh, I guess, would you say that maybe it's fair to say not just picking up a book, but also how about you just read up on this particular, um, you know, figure who fought for civil rights or, or how about you read up on this person on what, you know, what, um, what trajectory or path they, they kind of ran on to become the person that they eventually became. Um, yeah, that, or, that or sounds you. good if I'm in the mood. <laughs> right you know like after a while after a while I'm gonna be just straight up honest with y'all we're tired mm -hmm. and and after so many times of just ignorant comments and so many times of the gaslighting oh I didn't know and it, it's just it just depends I'll be straight up depends on my mood you know that's sometimes, perfectly reasonable <laughs> sometimes I will tell you oh well look at the you know read this book or this was a trailblazer maybe this will help you and other times I'll be like you know what just get out of my face mm -hmm. because you're a fool you know it just depends yes. it depends we I'm some we I'm tired sometimes I'm just tired yeah well there was something I wanted to touch on um when you're telling the story about 
uh, your husband's boss being there and witnessing someone being discriminatory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that is a perfect example of where it is helpful for allies of the community to speak up and you know yes. because you guys don't need i at the, people don't need to be doing this on their own it's not it's not a fight in the moment just between two individuals like it this is something systemic that we're fight all trying to fight to break down and so you know sometimes it's really really important for the ally to step in and and say you know not only hey that that was unacceptable that was disrespectful mm -hmm. that was hateful whatever you know but and then like us taking the time to explain and to teach uh, you know mm -hmm. uh, because like you said you know people are tired and sometimes people just don't want to hear like if they already have some sort of seed of hate or discontent in their heart, hearing something from someone that they feel that hate or discontent towards is not going to change anything. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. like they have to hear it from someone that they've, and as disgusting as this is to say, like they, people want to hear it from someone that they deem as their quote unquote equal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you know so that's that's why i try to facilitate conversations like this where you know we can become better educated about what is happening what we can do to intervene to change to support because it's not going to happen just from within the community itself like we ha all have to band together Exactly. Exactly. Allies are, are extremely important, um, especially when you're trying to, you know, you're trying to trailblaze, you're trying to change things. We have to do it together. You know, we have to, we, we have to, or mm -hmm. else nothing's going to change. And in this town, that's been the problem. Nobody is, is speaking out for the minority, really. Mm -hmm. um, I'm seeing change now, but like I said, I went to high school here and I'm, I'm now I'm seeing change, I'm, I'm 40. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So yes, allies are, are very important and, and kind of became the talk. You know, a lot of people start talking more about allies. I wanna say after, this, after the whole George Floyd thing is when I started mm -hmm. hearing about allies. Yeah, yeah, I okay. guess. Uh as awful as his murder was, sparked something. Yeah, it did. Absolutely. Brandy, what would you say, and this is just kind of moving away from what, from the, from this previous topic, what would you say about, um, like, for example, uh, right now we're in Black History Month, um, and then we sell, we also celebrate, like, different, different months for different, um, the, uh, to celebrate uh, the differences for with other people from where they come from. Now, one of the questions that I've just kind of uh, continued, to, it just continues to result, revolve around my mind. I'm just curious what your thought about it is, is we tend to only like, for example, black history, we only celebrate it. What we, we're celebrating like, okay, this is one month. We're celebrating black history one month. But my I guess my question is why, why is it just, one month where we just put a spotlight on it why is it not every day why is it not why do we have to why do we have to place a spotlight just once a year um and i just kind of feel like i i guess i just kind of wonder like what is your take on that like why does why do we have to remind people that this exists only once a year why do we have to remind people that um i don't know um lgbt month is only once a year hispanic his heritage is only once a year why can't we be inclusive and I guess maybe trying to come up with something? I realized you mentioned that you know you're you're um, you're a little bit older than 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 we are, or we mm -hmm. might. And I know that you know your generation is just exhausted because you've experienced 
things that maybe even, you know, we haven't been able to experience Mm -hmm. at one point or another, we might get become exhausted as well, because there's a lot of things that are happening. I mean, (laughs) just things that you hear in the news every day, you're just kind of like, okay, I thought we were, I thought we were past this guys. I mean, really? (laughs) And then it it just needs to be reintroduced. So I guess, what is your, what are your thoughts on that? Like, well, I mean, with, you know, I'm not happy about uh, Black history being the shortest month of the year. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, Put the words out of my Black, mouth, girl. Black history is American history, mm-hmm. you know, and that needs to be said more. You know, it, it, it really is. And I think, like, for me, you know, as a Black American, we deal with stuff every day right so then when I deal with things me personally when I deal with the, or when things happen to me injustices I look to my trailblazers so I'll look to you know Madam C.J. Walker like how did she yes. navigate and manage her way to being a millionaire and you know and I'll look at, at at those type of trailblazers throughout the year you know that's me personally and on my social media I'm constantly dropping little nuggets with black history all throughout the year in my stories um just so that that people can know and see you know this isn't the one month where you just dive into oh who who am I gonna look into that's it's a black trailblazer this month no I I do it throughout the year and I've I've always and I think that everyone should do that you know I I think that it's important to put put that in in everyone's faces and and show them you know like Hispanic history month like this do it all throughout the year this is who you are this is who I am you know I'm not going to suppress it when it's not February, you know, I'll, I'll bring up stories and, and talk about the four little girls that got burned in the church. You know, I'll do it in November if I'm feeling like it. Hey, you guys, you remember this? Let's not forget this American history. This is history. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Anthony. Anthony. Oh, sorry, Kayla, go ahead. No, go ahead, Anthony. You're perfect. No, I just, um, piggybacking off of what Victor was saying about history. Um, I know you, you said you graduated in 99. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I graduated in 2010. So it's not too far off. How do you feel about the way that black history is taught in schools, predominantly white schools? It's, it's awful. It's awful what's going on. It's well, especially out, out here, you know, I asked my daughter and it's like, you can talk about anything. <laughs> like, wait, what? It's, yeah. It's just like, okay, Martin Luther King, they'll talk about briefly. And then Black History, because like, she's part of the BSU, or was part of the BSU. She's like, I'm out now, because they're not mm-hmm. doing anything, really. Mm-hmm. But it's just, it's it's very sporadic. It's not detailed at all. Um, it's just, I'm very, I'm just disappointed. So I, I'm teaching my kids myself, mm-hmm. you know, and I do it throughout the year so that they know who these trailblazers are. But to answer your question, no, I'm not pleased with, with how it's being taught in schools. Absolutely, I, I agree. I didn't get a chance to say thanks so much for coming coming and talking to us. And oh, you know, absolutely. We do. In a town like Temecula that I actually work at the Outback on Winchester and um, having interacted with the people here, yeah, there's definitely a bubble and a consistent attitude. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, well, and uh, along that uh, line about education, um, I my my schooling was split between uh, San Bernardino and Temecula, um, and San Bernardino was a pretty diverse community, and you know we learned a lot out there but then came out here and I mean it's like you said like it it was almost non-existent like talking about it in in school Mm -hmm. and I um you know I have done a lot of my own research 
and, you know, talking to friends and family and whatnot. Um, but there were still things, you know, like I just took um, a U.S. history, uh, post-Civil War U.S. history class um, here at MSJC last semester. And when I tell you, I learned so many things. I mean, the stuff that, like some, you know, stuff that a, a topic was covered, but like I only ever was told part of the story or like, you know, one, the perspective, you know, I, I was only ever taught the white perspective when in reality, there's all these other groups that have been a part of our nation and its history and how it was built. And, and you know, it that's, just, it blew my mind. <laughs> that's what I think is so crazy from somebody who, I'm from Connecticut originally, so I put on, went to a pretty much all white school and even what they do teach you about black history is like you said, the one side, but it's such a diminished version of what even MLK, because like mm -hmm. if you read some of the stuff he said towards the end of his life, it's not what they taught you in history class in high school. Mm -hmm. they, mm -hmm. they don't ever teach about really the government or, and this is my biggest problem and the biggest discovery that blew my mind was how much the government, especially from, I mean, for, yeah, from the entire beginning of the civil rights movements all the way to the end of the 60s and beyond, the way they systematically went after every civil rights leader and every person in the black community who was trying to make a change. Yeah, even the Mal Malcolm X, the Black Panthers, mm -hmm. all of them. If you look into oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. the Black Panthers, it was terrible what they did. You know, they, and they started off helping kids with lunch programs, getting lunch absolutely. programs together. Absolutely. That's, I just, I, I actually just read a book, um, The Assassination of Fred Hampton, because after mm -hmm. I watched the Judas and Black Messiah movie, mm -hmm. and just the amount that they never, there's like the, it's like, yes, the Black Panthers existed, and the only picture they show is them standing out with guns in front of the California Capitol building. Right. So, like no mention that they were trying to open medical clinics and give free breakfast to people. And they were arming themselves because the police were beating them dead in the streets and there were no cameras to catch them doing it. So they were like, mm -hmm. we're our rights, just like all the white people do. And we're mm -hmm. going to make sure that our communities aren't going to be brutalized by cops anymore. Right. Right. Yeah. But we can't, we can't teach that to innocent little white kids. They, Exactly. They would be traumatized because they want to see. They want them to see <laughs> the institutions of law as absolute and never wrong. That they want them to see the FBI as th this is the rule of law and these are the people who stop the bad guys. But in reality, they wiretap Martin Luther King's house and they killed Fred Hampton. So mm -hmm. you know that wouldn't be great to show them that they were just murder. They were just blatantly assassinating people. Yeah. Right. Right. It's, yeah, just the, thinking about it with Fred Hampton, like those, yeah, it's, you know, and for, for a Black American, for me, it just, I have to really protect my mental because those, reading those things and going back to those things, even talking about those things causes, you know, a little bit of mental trauma really messes with our heads mm -hmm. because, you know, this it's some heavy stuff and, and, um, yeah, it's just, it's real heavy. And it, it obviously doesn't bother me as, you know, it bothers you a thousand times more. Yeah. I have the luxury of being able to go and read that stuff and be like, wow, that was terrible. But, you know, it didn't happen to a member of my community. Right. We don't have to sit there and go, that could have been me. Right. Or that could have yeah. been my dad yeah. or my sister it's, or my daughter yeah, or, Yeah it's really close, it's really hard because of the stories that my mom even told me, you know? And, you know, there was a time where my dad was getting grocery store, going to the grocery store and getting his groceries out the car and then a cop put a shotgun to his back because he 
they said that there was another black man with a brown jacket that had stolen something and he could have had his he could have been killed you know and this is my father you know what I'm saying and it's just yeah it's it's pretty heavy stuff for us to to go back and and talk about and um yeah it's it's just heavy brandy um if there's anyone that might be wanting to i guess better understand um better understand the differences um and how we how hard differences really are very much like uh, what book would you recommend or what um literature would you recommend that they that you would recommend people to go to? Oh, that's tough. There's so many books. <laughs> is, I guess, is there any one particular um, leader that you um, that you really look to? Um, I mean, I would think there, there are very yep. many. Read the, the biography of Malcolm X. Okay. That's one of my favorites. He's always been one of my favorite leaders. Why is he your favorite, one of your favorite leaders? Um, he, you know, he started off, it's, let me get it out. I don't know why I get all emotional when I think about him. With the Nation of Islam, right? Mm -hmm. So he goes to Islam and he sees the people of all different colors and races. And then he goes back, comes back after he goes to Islam and he's telling um, his leader, um, like, listen, there's all different types of Muslims here. And he's, mm. he, see, he, he opened his eyes, right? And he's trying to explain things to people because he sees the light. He sees things that are right and good. And um, he was true to himself. And I think that's why I loved him so much. Even when he got pushed back from his own people, he was still true to who he was and he he was still standing by what he believed because he saw something different than what he was taught. And um, that's why that's why I look to him. That was really yeah. powerful. Yeah, that is very powerful. Yeah, he's I don't, I don't know if you've seen it. Um, there is a film on him that um, it, where Malcolm X was portrayed by um, Denzel Washington. Um, it's a very good, uh, very good film about um, Mr. Malcolm X as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've seen it. The book is, it, it has a lot more meat than the movie. Oh, don't so they I, always. Yes, you never I cram it all you. into a movie. I uh, recommend it. I definitely recommend the book. I was actually uh, gonna, that was my next question. What did you think of, what, what did you think of it? But um, <laughs> thank you for sharing that. <laughs> um, I wanna say hello, Brandy, and thank you for coming on to Talon. I was wondering, um, I'm a history major. I've taken, um, put it out there for anybody who's listening. There's some great classes MSJC does. Um, I took History 160 last semester and took uh, Black History American Context and Lit 260 Introduction to African American Literature. And I've done uh, projects when I was in high school about uh, their national competition uh, on the Black Panther Party and their community survival programs. And my last, my senior year, I did. Um, Birmingham 1963 Triumphs and Tragedies and other projects at MSJC too. So who do you, um, there's like, I think there's like four main people for Af for Black History Month. There's like Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, Jackie Robinson, and about that. And I love all those people, but who do you think should be added more to the greater list? Who do you look up to or trailblazers that should be mentioned more than the top three to four? Oh, definitely Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. And then I would say Madam C.J. Walker because I'm in the hair care industry. Um, I would definitely say those two. A lot of people don't know too much about Madam C.J. or Malcolm X. I think that those would be good ones then another one I think would be great and she's not really talked about much is Dorothy Dandridge you know she actually was the, the first 
Black woman to be able to perform on stage in Vegas hmm. and, you know, refuse to, to bow down, refuse to, you know, not, they wouldn't let her go in the pool and she jumped in the pool anyway. You know, like things like that, there's, there's quite a few out there that should be added. That's, that is a tough question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and I, I've come up with a list too of um, some people, when I was, I did, um, um, and I'm also interested in sports and I, last semester, I made a whole website about an equal playing field, um, highlighting unsung heroes in, in sports um from jackie to kenny washington to bobby mitchell um rafer johnson earl lloyd arthur ash uh fritz pollard and willie overy all barrier breakers in their sports um for the project that um i did in high school was i think he should he doesn't get enough credit as martin luther king um is uh reverend fred shuttlesworth and he told king to come to because he was in albany right before he came to birmingham and I looked in my history textbook. You really don't hear about Birmingham. You probably see pictures. It's the people being shot. I mean, the water cannons and the police dogs. That's what you'll probably see in Birmingham, but they don't mention the Birmingham campaign. And F F Shellsworth told King to come there because if they can break Birmingham, because it's the most racist place in the country, if you mm -hmm. can break Birmingham, then everywhere else it will fall. And that's um, because of the pub commissioner of public safety, which is completely ironic, is Bull Connor, who told he was a mm, piece of work and used those cannon water cannons on those on the children. Those that was during the children's march, actually. And that was in the spring. That was before the bo the bombing of the four little girls. And he even there's even stories told by it. One I interviewed a few people down there. Is that he told King whether um he told Bull Reverend Fred Schelzer they're gonna be here at that exact time, and just be ready for us. We're gonna be there. And even there was another story of um Shuttlesworth, They stole um the police officers' lunches from them, and started eating them. <laughs> But he was, wow. uh, he had a fire yeah. under him. He was, um, and there's like story of him. It was, they try to bomb him on the Christmas Eve or the Christmas, yeah, Christmas Eve. And it shook his house and destroyed it, but he was fine. He was kind of, story was that he kind of um, rose up in his bed and he fell back on his bed. He didn't, it was, um, but his house was like tilted and destroyed. It was right next to his um, church congregation. Um, but then they moved across the street, but he looked, yeah, he, they could break Birmingham th there than it did with the 1964 cell rights and 65 and 68 with the housing. Have you yeah, seen, there, go ahead. Um, have you seen, um, it's been a little bit since I seen it, but, um, it was a, kind of a live documentary or a live, um, action of Madam CJ Walker. Are you talking think, about self-made on Netflix? Yeah, it's Netflix, yeah. You know what? I have not seen it yet. And everyone oh, keeps girl, asking if I have. It's I'm really gonna good. see it. Yeah, it's um Octavia Spencer as uh Madam CJ Walker. Um and she did an incredible job. Yeah. It's definitely gonna be on the list. <laughs> Let me watch it um all right well we've talked about a lot of things um if does anybody have any uh final questions or comments before we wrap up here thank well, you guys for having me on. oh this and thank great. you thank you very much for for coming on and making time um and talking about um the heavy stuff as well as you know the the happy stuff um because it all it's all important so right um yeah so uh thank you again for joining us um if you guys you so much, want brandy. to follow uh brandy and her story ongoing um she is at bk koa on instagram 
Um, so definitely give her a follow, like, share her stuff, uh, learn some more about Black history, both past and present, um, and join us for our next Talent Talks. Yeah, and feel free to follow my personal page, too. <laughs> Oh yeah, could, is that, and that's just it's at just Brandy K. Cola, right? Brandy K. Cola. Yeah, that's where I bring small businesses on to talk about their business. Okay, great. Yeah, well, thank you for adding that. Of course. Uh, all right, well, uh, I think that's about it. Thanks for joining us and have a great night, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much, Brandy. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 <clears throat>